family it is always good to be with you on a powerful thursday um i'm, I'm honored to to continue to speak to the sonetta tv studios family the black news 102 family i'm here with your brother sonetta who you know is in those streets bringing you knowledge who else is doing that really who else and he said that no no I, and he said to me brother jabari what are you waiting for is there something that excites you and i know that i had to tell him that i'm looking forward to the sonetta tv awards um uh, you have to understand that uh when we get to celebrate the work that we're doing in the community to try to raise consciousness to assist our people um that's gonna be a powerful thing there are no other awards like it um, the closest thing, of course, are those amazing awards that take place in Atlanta. We're talking about the Black Power Awards. But uh, for those of you who are thinking there's some conflict, let's be real. Right. When you watch your TV every year, you got to watch the Academy Awards. You got to watch the Grammy Awards. You got to watch the Video Awards. For the people who are the oldest people on the planet, you think one award show is enough? You better be sure that um, we, we're going to salute those brothers of the Black Power Awards and come with something that's powerful and unique with the Sonnetter Award. So I'm excited. I can't wait to get down with it. Um, you know, I'm going to be in the house. Um, Sonnetter better not plan it for when I'm out of the country because I'm going to be really upset with him. Yeah, it better be when I'm here um, because I want to be in the house greeting the people, seeing the honorees, um, chilling in the green room backstage, to be there for the pre-show, the post show it's gonna be live and if you are hearing the sound of my voice and you are not in the tri-state area you had better hit up saw and say what you what time you looking for because you're gonna need to get your flights ready you're gonna need to get your gas in your car you're gonna need to be ready so you can come forward for the sonnet award so please be ready and be prepared for a really unique important groundbreaking event with that let me say that um, I am coming to you today with what I think is an important topic. Now, I know that we talk a lot about the things that are ailing the black community, the, the things that are ailing Africans worldwide, and those are really important topics. But sometimes it's helpful for us to take a step back and get a sense of what's going on in the popular culture in the country of the United States and even worldwide. And some of you might think that popular cultural issues are trivial, that they're not that important. But in actuality, think of it this way. More people will go to a major blockbuster, a summer blockbuster, than will ever be in a black history course, ever be in an African history course, ever be in a history course in one summer. So understand, if you just look at one movie in the summer, you're going to see more people watching that movie than will be in all of those endeavors probably within 10 years. That's how influential and how important that kind, this kind of format is. So we have to actually critique the things that the people are watching. Unfortunately, not everybody is watching Sonnetter. Mm -hmm. They watch an ABC, they watch an NBC, they watch an CBS, they're in, at the movies. Some folks have never even had access to what some people call the conscious community. Sometimes I hear people talk about the conscious community like we are so um, influential that every person of black or, or every person of African descent is aware of us. And you better know that it's not the truth. But if you ask someone if they heard of Wolverine, if you ask someone if they've heard of Superman, 
If you ask someone if they've seen an image of Wonder Woman, you're going to see the volume of people that are familiar with these characters. So it is important for us to analyze, it is important for us to recognize that popular culture is very influential in the thinking of not just people of African descent, but people of all descent. This is really important. Think, for example, that I'm a, a, on a little bit of a tangent just to give you an idea of how influential this is. Some of you, um, we're going to talk about comic book movies in a minute, and you're going to find out that not only is Jabari El Saze a, a historian and a comedic priest, but I actually am, am sort of a comic book nerd for many, many years, right? I've been following these stories for many, many years. And one of the stories I wanted to see come to the big screen was Doctor Strange. Now, I'm going to tell you, as a comedic priest and someone who is, is earning a, a doctorate in metaphysical sciences, someone who deals with esoteric symbols, Doctor Strange, I knew, was going to be a really interesting movie. Well, some of you might have also heard that his major teacher in the comics was someone they called the Ancient One. He was actually supposed to be, I believe, a, an old Tibetan man. Ask yourself why they didn't cast the Ancient One as an old Tibetan man. Instead, they chose a, a Celtic woman. Why? Because Marvel wanted to be able to bring in dollars in the Chinese market, a major movie market, and not offend them by talking about a land that they have actually occupied for decades, Tibet. That's how influential this is. You're watching a, a comic book movie in the summer, and you don't even understand that right before you are geopolitical issues right on the screen in the way that these characters are cast. So you better understand that we need to analyze popular culture, understand popular culture, demystify popular culture, and be prepared to come to our people with a deeper understanding of images that they think are simple. And there's my second point. When you think that you're watching something that isn't actually an affront to you, when you think you're watching something that's just strictly for your entertainment, in some ways I think that your, your barriers, your filters, to some degree are, um, are down. You're not actually prepared. You allow some of these images, some of these concepts, to come to you in a very, very unadulterated fashion. That can be dangerous if you don't know what you're looking at and if you don't understand the underlying issues addressed by the creator, addressed by the community that created it, addressed by the industry that created it. That's the challenge that you'll have. You think you're going to just be sitting there with your huge, gigantic Coca-Cola and some popcorn and you're just watching a movie when perhaps you're actually seeing something that is meant in, the, in a very, very subliminal manner to give you messages that can be damaging or sometimes even can be wholesale theft. And that's one of the things that I'm going to argue here. So understand that that's another way for us to look at that. So today I'm going to talk to you about a concept that I call hidden in plain sight, comedic or ancient African mythology in modern comic book movies. So first of all, let me say to you that um, I know that any, all comic book nerds and other comic book fans and, and other just movie fans cannot wait for February 2018 because you know that Marvel is coming forward with Black Panther and I know it is incredible. I think they put every black person on the planet in this movie. I think Sonetta going to be watching the movie. He's going to see the he in the movie somewhere. I mean, they put everybody in the movie. They got, they got Angela Bassett. They have um, uh, uh, the brother that, that played Creed, the, the Creed in, in the latest Rocky movie, Michael B. Jordan. They have um, the brother Daniel Kalau that was in Get Out in the movie. And, of course, they have my brother, Chadwick Boseman, someone who I actually know. I worked with Brother Chadwick for several years when we were at the Apollo, at the um, the Schomburg Library together. And I'm gonna tell you that Brother Boseman, it was a grounded brother. He was a brother that cared about our community. He was a brother that cared about our youth. Um, I, I actually 
uh, now that he's an A-list star, I've almost lost contact with him. But I'm going to tell you that I knew him for many years, and I thought that he was a good brother then. Oh, boy, he's incredible. Uh, and of course they have Forrest Whitaker in there. Listen, they got everybody in there, sir. Everybody's in there. I'm telling you that this is one of those films that they thought was going to really um, attract a large audience, but particularly it was going to get black folk out. And you know that they did, because what month did they decide they were going to drop it in? February. Oh, so they figured they are going to drop it in Black History Month. Listen, that's, that's your thing. if I could buy tickets, I would already have tickets. The Shrine of Ma'at is going to be up in there opening day. It's going to be an event. We're going to go there, watch the movie, enjoy the movie, critique the movie, analyze the movie. A pad? Brother, you know what I do? I end up often bringing, um, well... Maybe I shouldn't say this. Let's say that I, before the weekend, I'm going to see the movie a few times. Let's say it that way. Because Brother Jabari is going to make sure that he is able to um, take in all of the information that comes to us from this film. And if you're not excited, I want you to just take a quick look. So you really are a Marvel freak. A Marvel I'm into Marvel and DC, but more Marvel. I like Marvel more than DC. So, I mean, I've been reading um, comic books since the 70s. Um, I don't collect anymore because there was a point in my life where I realized it was becoming very expensive and I wanted to buy a house. And so if I had continued to collect comic books, you would not be standing in this space right now. <laughs> so, so that's one of the reasons why I stopped collecting. But I still keep um, contact with all of the latest mythology. One of the reasons why I think it's so powerful, and I didn't know this as a kid, is because really what they're doing is they're drawing from our myth. More on that in a few moments. Take a quick look at the Black Panther trailer. It's going to be incredible. And I really believe that with the, the, ca the caliber of actors that they've put in this film, perhaps we're going to see a film that we can actually be happy about. I'm really hoping that they will. Um, and when we talk about ancient African myth in um, in comic book movies, of course you expect to see it in Black Panther, right? Well, if you've read the comic book, you'll know that the people of Wakanda, this, this um, fictional high-tech nation that Black Panther is the new king of, they actually regularly channel the divine forces. So here's a, a page from actually the comic version, and you'll see that one of the deities that they're drawing from is Bast. Bast is the, the, the force of um, motherhood from ancient Kemet. You'll even see that they're calling um, they're calling on Toth. They call it Toth here, but we know that this is Jehuti or Tehuti, the symbol of divine wisdom and and measure in ancient Kemet. And you even see that they have a, a deity they call Ptah the Shaper. And you know that Ptah um, is is really dear to me because I was raised. In the comic this is in the comic movies. book. These are the, look at it right here. You're oh, looking at the screen. I'm gonna send you all of the slides. I'm gonna send you all the slides. So wow. you you should see that. that. Like Tahuti right there. Yeah, this is Tahuti right here. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And they call them Toth because they're using a Greek name. Right. But understand that they are saying that these deities, these divine forces, are the forces that guide the Wakandan people. This is powerful. And I was saying that Ptah is near and dear to me because Brother Jabari was raised as a young Kamite in the Shrine of Ptah by Baru Heru Ank Ra Samad Se Ptah. So that technically, while I'm a priest of Ma'at, I was first a priest of Ptah. And so this is powerful. They even went back as far as saying that they were also going to be guided by a deity known as Mujaji. Mujaji is actually a South African deity. It's a femi feminine deity of the rains that comes from the Levedu people in South Africa. So the folks that are writing this, even before we saw our dear brother that writes for the Atlantic um, come forward and take his own take on, on um, Black Panther, um, you know that this actually is something that um, the, the folks who were writing this comic book have been drawing from for a long time. 
a long time, long before we see Ta-Nehisi Coates actually write his, his version. His version was excellent as well. Um, in the latest version of Black Panther, Black Panther actually is gone beyond his na nation of Wakanda, this hidden African nation, and now they're on a planet that they call Bast. So you better know that this is some powerful stuff. You expect to see African mythology in Black Panther, don't you? I know you do. But you better understand that it ain't just Black Panther. That they have, that folks who have been putting forward these comics have been drawing from our myth, drawing from our understanding for a long time, and not when they're depicting African characters. But why do most people don't know this? Because you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. You have to actually be familiar with African myth in order to recognize it when it's being drawn from. So I'm going to talk to you about at least three movies and reference a bunch of others and also reference the general um, comic descriptions from um, Batman and Superman. You'll see one of the movies I'm going to draw from heavily is Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. We're also going to talk about Suicide Squad, which came out earlier this year, that um, actually is a DC movie. And we're going to talk about Thor Ragnarok. This is a recent film that came out in November. And um, you'll notice that there seemed to be a lot of ancient African mythology used in this film as well. Generally speaking, I believe that DC uses African myth um, in their comics more than Marvel does, more than they do, particularly when you're talking about um, movies in this major movie um, uh, period. So let's, let's, let's uh, uh, try to underscore why this is important. This particular listing comes from um, uh, Box Office Mojo, this is particularly a, a website, a, a, an outfit that analyzes how much money particular movies are earning. And so what should you take a look at? Here are the hundred, the top hundred, well, I think this is all of them. Yeah, this is all of the top comic book movies that have come out from 1978 to the present. Now, some of you are the, the young people in the audience that say, 1978 is a long time. No, it wasn't. Jabari was six years old. <laughs> so understand that from the 70s, uh, almost the late 70s to now, there have been a lot of movies to come out. The top grossing comic book movie is Marvel's The Avengers, and it grossed somewhere around $623 million. <laughs> But understand, if you add all of those movies, I'm talking about adding Marvel's The Avengers and The Dark Knight and Age of Ultron and Captain American Civil, uh, America Civil War and some of the Spider-Man films, this was done before the latest Spider-Man film came out. You're actually going to see that all of these movies have grossed a whopping $18 billion dollars. $18 billion, yet we're still catching hell in the hood. $18 billion, yet some of the poorest people on the planet live in are, and are from the African continent. When in actuality, most, many of these depictions drew directly from our story, drew directly from our history, drew directly from our worldview, and did not give us credit. Africans should be empowering themselves and, yes, even enriching themselves from those stories that their foreparents told them. But That's the most important part of this. Let me ask you a question. But see, this is where good counseling comes into play. Good lawyership comes into play. Mm. You know, we too busy running around now trying to sue for reparations instead of dealing with the now. What if we had good representatives amongst us, Cochran is no longer here, where we can sue for them using our story. That's where nation comes in that. See, we don't look at ourselves and think in terms of nation. So if we think in terms of nation and had somebody really to represent us, that brother, we could really sue them for using our story and we can prove it. But we don't have that and we don't have unity in nationhood. Here's Think about that. Here's the challenge, though. Many of these stories are very old. 
And we know that the Western world has created this concept of copyright infringement. Right. And usually, right. at about 100 years, the copyright disappears. But at around 100 party. years. They say now, copyright. But you take our science, and then now, and, and we can't get it because you're saying it's copyright. At, but it's our science. But here's the deal. No, I'm not saying that they've copyrighted. Well, to some degree, you know they have. Saying. Yes, I'm, we're gonna go into exactly what you're saying. Right. You're saying something even deeper that we gotta go into. Yeah. We, uh, he's saying something deeper, family. You you have to hear what he said, and then we're gonna talk about exactly the ramifications of what Brother Sonetta just said. But understand that suing these companies for using things that come from Africa would not work in today's um, time frame because of how long the copyright lasts. Uh -huh. So some of these stories are thousands of years old. But what we should be doing is making our own stories from them. What we should be doing is finding ways to empower ourselves from these stories in and of itself. Some people who say that they're not Africans don't recognize that what they're doing is they're giving up the wellspring of natural resources, the wellspring of spiritual resources, and in fact, they're even giving up the wellspring of fictional and creative resources. So many Westerners have drawn from your story family in order to empower and enrich themselves. So that is what we should be doing. Instead of letting someone else earn the cash mm -hmm. from these endeavors, it should be us. $18 billion. This is, this is where I'm, I'm trying to go here. And let me address what Son Netter said here. He said, well, now we're not able to use some of these because there's a copyright, right? Mm -hmm. And yes, let's say, for example, I'll tell you, I, I did part of this lecture for my Cometic Ascension, my, my bi-weekly worship um, services that we have here every other Sunday at the Shrine of Ma'at. Um, it's streamed live, by the way, so if you join our Facebook page at Shrine of Ma'at, you'll be able to, to um, be part of it live. But I'll tell you, we were actually talking about some of these issues, and we streamed a clip from one of the movies. Guess what Facebook did? Blocked. Facebook blocked it because they said we were infringing on someone's copyright. So the people who focus on ancient African myth can't actually effectively talk about these Westerners that are drawing from ancient African myth without being restricted by other Westerners who are making billions of dollars. This is really an interesting story when you think of it that way. Now, and I'm going to tell you also that unfortunately on the internet, some of these, these, um, these streaming sites and, and, and social media sites, they take things down just so they can sort it out. So the reality is what I was doing was clearly in fair use. I was critiquing something. So I wasn't infringing on the copyright by showing a clip and talking about the movie. Not at all. But Facebook and YouTube have bots. They have small programs that... Um, uh, uh, check to see if certain people's, certain companies' copyright has been infringed on, and they'll literally drop you quickly without even investigating whether you are using it adequately. So this gets to what Brother Sonetta was saying. So let's start with perhaps the most important superhero in all of history. The superhero that is an archetype for most other superheroes. The superhero that is most familiar to all of the world's people. And we have to say that is Superman. Superman isn't the first superhero. He's um, put together in, in the early 1900s by um, uh, two Jewish um, high school students, but understand he is the one that is most recognizable. In fact, you'll see there have been all sorts of other versions of Superman and references to Superman. His um, blue, yellow, and red costume is iconic. There probably isn't anyone uh, on the known earth that doesn't recognize it and, and recognize this large S. Of course, now they're saying it's not quite an S, but this large S on his chest. Understand that he is as popular and has earned as uh, earned dist um, Warner Brothers and DC Comics more money than perhaps any other superhero. This is big. In fact, I think that it might even be interesting to see what a copy of Superman number one is worth right now. Because I guarantee you that it's worth a whole heck of a lot of money. 
So understand that um, folks have been drawing from this for a long time, earning cash from it from a long t- for a long time, and you had better understand that Ooh, look at this. Superman number one sold for 10 cents, one dime, when it came out in 1938. Saad, do you know how much it recently sold for? No. A nearly perfect copy of that comic book sold for $3.2 million. $3.2 billion. For the original. For the original copy. By the way, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Now I'm upset. Now Jabari's upset because when Jabari was a kid, I saw a copy for a hundred thousand oh. dollars. I tried to convince my family, my family was a very poor family, that we should buy a copy because it was an incredible investment. Now, of course, even if we had scraped together a hundred thousand dollars in nineteen eighty, it would have been a hundred thousand dollars. If you invested in micro a hundred thousand dollars in Microsoft, would you have three point two million? I'm not sure. Yeah, this is it is an incredible investment. I know that I also can try to convince my family to buy a copy of X Men number one, which was forty dollars. And my father said, "Boy, you crazy! I'm not buying no funny book for forty dollars." And the funny thing is that it's worth several hundreds of thousands of dollars now. It would have been an incredible investment, but we didn't necessarily recognize that. So let's talk about Superman for a second. Recognize that Superman, according to the great myth that is Superman, is an alien. He's from the planet Krypton. In fact, some people, they, we used to always hear that he was the last survivor of Krypton. We now know that there were a few other survivors, including the, his, his cousin, um, Kara Zor-El, who was known as, as Supergirl. But being one of the last survivors, when he is sent to Earth, he realizes that he actually has amazing powers and abilities. Why? Because Krypton has a red sun, which meant that on Krypton, Kryptonians' powers and abilities were very similar to humans here on Earth. But here on Earth, our solar system is governed by a yellow sun, and that yellow sun gives him power. So recognize right off the bat that Superman is a sun deity. He draws his power from the sun. Let me go a little bit further for those of you who are skeptical so you understand how even the creators and certainly the writers today recognize him as a solar deity. And as a solar deity, recognize he has immense power. He has incredible strength. He has flight. He has near invulnerability. He has cool breath and can blow things long distances. He's almost as fast as the fastest human in the DC universe. He actually has heat vision. He has amazing powers, all because of the yellow sun. So is they getting it from the sun rock when they see it? When you hear this, when you hear this, uh, so let's go further. When you look at the comic book, how many of you knew that there was a prime deity on Krypton? Oh, man. Did you know that? Did you know that there was a prime deity? What is the name of the deity on Krypton? Well, here's a panel from a recent comic book where you see Superman held aloft by the deity. What is his name? His name is Rao. So you're telling me that the deity on Krypton's name is Rao? And you don't recognize that they're, it's a reference to Ray or Ra? That they're drawing from ancient comedic, ancient African myth? Even in the comic book, if you look at the panel, you'll see that Rao here is holding Superman almost in an image that is evocative of the, um, the, the sacred image of Austin Heru. Now, some of you are going to say that this looks more like Mary and Jesus, but Mary and Jesus in that statue that we call the Madonna and Child, or sometimes even the Pieta, understand that it is a reference to Austin Heru. Christians need to understand that Christianity and all of the West's most important imagery and characterization comes from ancient Africa. Oh, actually has the sun behind his head? I was going to say that, but I know you was going to get You got to recognize that this is a solar deity and in this instance Superman in some ways is considered to be his son. So, let's let's talk a little bit more about what's happened in recent films so you can see how this plays out. Now, um, I think if you watch Superman movies, you're going to notice that 
they continually utilize him to be an archetype of the savior myth. Some of you are probably only familiar with the Savior that many call Jesus the Christ. But understand that there were many, there were a multitude of saviors who gave their lives for the world before Jesus. Saviors like Dionysus, saviors like uh, Saturn, saviors certainly like Asar, who the Greeks called Osiris, and certainly like Heru, who the Greeks called Horus. These saviors did these things long before there was a Jesus to Christ. And certainly, when Superman is depicted, you're going to note that they're drawing from this imagery. So this is a clip from Superman Returns. This was a film that came out in 2006. It, it, it um, focused, it actually uh, starred Brandon Routh. This is when he was playing Superman. So take a quick look at this scene. Now, to set it up, let me let you know. I don't know if they're going to let me show that, though. I'm gonna show, what you can do is you can show a picture of it. So try it. I don't th they may not cut you down from this. Right. But what I would do is if, it, if, it, if you get cut down, I'll, there's a picture in the slides I'm going to give you. You can obviously show a picture. All right, okay. But for the family, if you're able to see the clips, it's best. So you can actually see how the director and how the, the um, actual um, uh, 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 authors and the script authors were trying to show you this image. So... To set it up, Superman here actually has been injured by um, Lex Luthor, his arch enemy, but Lex Luthor has found a way to create this sort of synthetic kryptonite that is harming Superman, but it's growing in an uncontrolled manner to the point where it will literally cover the entire planet. So what does Superman do even though he's injured? He finds this intestinal fortitude, this inner strength to take this large nearly continental sized image, uh, image, continental sized um, section of this uh, synthetic kryptonite, this, this, this material that harms him, and he flies off in with it, he flies off with it into space so he can throw it into the sun. So take a look at what happens as he literally seems to have give to, given his life for this endeavor. So you see him falling back after doing this great deed. And how is he depicted? Notice his arms outspread with his legs pointing down. What they're trying to say is that Superman has been crucified. That he's given his life for the people. And that is how they are attempting to draw once again the savior myth here to Superman. So after this, he's pulled back into the, onto the earth by its gravity. And you can see that he's falling helplessly, literally, literally hundreds, if not thousands of miles. And the people of his beloved city are actually looking at his near lifeless body falling back to the earth. And he falls into what becomes literally a crater. So it seems here that perhaps Superman has died. So you actually see the way they depicted his descent onto the earth. They were attempting to say that he is a crucified savior. We're going to go much further, and you're going to see much more of this. But this is not just something that happened in a movie that seems to not have been as popular. Ten years later, you know that um, the, uh, the DC essentially has rebooted Superman under um, an actor known as Henry Cavill. And they have been moving rapidly towards, uh, they had been moving rapidly towards a superhero team-up movie known as Justice League, which came out um, last month and actually did not do very well, you should know. Didn't do very well. In fact, there's a shakeup at DC that's occurring right now because the movie will probably be deemed a financial loss. It actually wasn't very good. But you'll note that um, much of the movie once again reflects our myth. 
So here you're seeing uh, uh, some scenes from the movie that has been called Batman v Superman that came out in two Dawn of Justice, which came out in 2016. By the way, it, it stars a uh, Ben Affleck as Batman and Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. Jesus. <clears throat> Let's go deeper, family, because I know on the Sodnetta Studios platform, you expect us to go deep. We can't just give you a surface level understanding. We can't just scratch the very outer coating of an issue and expect that that's going to be enough for you. In the chat room, you'd be going crazy. So let's go a little deeper here. Are we actually simply seeing Jesus, uh, Jesus here as Superman? And you're seeing here the two Marys here, by the way. Is that what we're seeing? Or is there something else? Family, I want you to look carefully. Why does Batman arrive at Superman before Wonder Woman? When Wonder Woman can fly, Wonder Woman actually is a, a superhero that actually has powers. There's a reason why they had Batman attend to Superman's body. Now, you read the myth that is the Jesus Christ myth. Who attends to his body? Why is it that they have Batman do this here? Because here, Batman is not Batman. Batman is Anpu. That is why. Woo, yeah. Batman is who the Greeks call Anubis. That is why he clasps Superman's arms right over left over his chest. Uh. Because Batman is Anpu. They recognize that they're not just telling the story of Jesus, but of earlier Jesuses. Let me say that. They're not just telling a story of a Savior, but they're telling the oldest story of a Savior. They are referencing your story. Take a look at this image from a tomb, and you're actually going to see the two birds attending to the body of a Sar. These two birds, the one on the left with the throne on her head, is Ast, or Isis, as the Greeks called her. And the one on the right is um, the, the deity that you should all know as Inbethet. The people are saying you showed the old, the old trailer. The new one is even better. Of, of, uh, of Black Panther? Yeah, yes, yes, I did. Yes, oh, I did. Okay. Listen, I can't show it to you all. Right. But they yeah, you know, why, you know why they're commenting? Because they're comic book nerds like I'm a comic book nerd. That's basically what's happening. Right. And it's, it's, it's going to be hotness. But family, you should just meet with the Shrine of Ma'at when we go. We're going we're gonna to publicize when we're going. Obviously, we're not expecting money for it. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, you just pay for your ticket and you're going to all meet there, watch the movie, and then go to eat somewhere afterwards to talk about what we saw. So here you're seeing the two ladies once again. Right. You have Inbedhet on the right that the Greeks called Neftis. So understand that this iconography of the crucified or dying savior attended by the two ladies is earlier a reference to a sar mm. long before thousands of years before that imagery was used for jesus the christ by the way christ is not even a christian term more on that in another debate another discussion you're actually seeing the two ladies tend to the body and here you're seeing another image of the two ladies giving divine life because you see them putting their hands toward the Shen. And then you see Batman. And who do you see down. attending the body? Anpu. Oh, this man. is what they're drawing from. Mm. This is not Jesus the Christ. They knew very well that they were mixing a few things together, but the greatest mythos they were drawing from was the comedic mythos. And should you be surprised that DC and Warner Brothers chose to use that mythos to be able to depict this story? No, because the Christian story itself is a reference to this great ancient comedic image, this great ancient comedic myth. That's what this is. Now, let's go further. These two ladies... You should understand, were the beloved ones of Asar. What is the word for love in ancient Kemet? The word for love in ancient Kemet is myrrh. There's a reason why we're mentioning this. Because myrrh, when you pluralize it, 
you can say it's Marie. So that these two ladies, who we knew are of, as the Marys, Mary the mother of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, were actually a reference to the Mary, Ost and Inbethet. They were called Mary. In fact, Ost herself, one of her titles was Mary. Mm. So you need to understand that when you think you're talking about Mary, by the way, the woman in the Bible's name was Miriam. Why would you call a woman in the most important female character in the entire Bible by a nickname? Why would you do that? Because it wasn't a nickname at all. They want those who have eyes to see and ears to hear to understand that they're referencing an earlier myth of the Mary. And that is the reason why this is depicted this way. Now, on the right, you can see the resurrected Asar with his two ladies behind him as well. His wife, Ost, or Isis, or Oset. Isis is the Greek name. I'm just giving you these names so you can do your own research. So, when I invoked Ost, I don't use that. Of course. You going to show something? No. Oh. That's a whole other discussion, Sa. Oh. Superman does get resurrected, obviously, in Justice League. You knew that even... Oh, from a business per, uh, perspective, you know that DC and Warner Brothers wouldn't have killed their greatest hero, perhaps the greatest superhero, and just let him die. Mm -hmm. Of course he's been resurrected. They let him stay dead for a little bit, and they had these other supermen come forward to, to sort of try to bring order. But of course he was resurrected. And he's um, in, the, in the movie, guess who is the major um, uh, uh, vehicle in Justice League for his resurrection. Of course it's Batman. Of course it's Batman. Because you know that Batman is not just in the movies as Batman. He is an archetype of Anpu. So of course Batman had to be the one that came up with the, the, the actual process, the remedy to the death of Superman. But let's go further. I'm not just leaving you there. Some of you have been studying this, know this stuff already. But Jabari, this right here proves, I mean, what you're saying is true because look at the mummy. Yeah, oh yeah. Look at the movie mummy. Listen. So they're showing you that they're using your stuff. They continually stuff. draw from our stuff. And sometimes they do it in a disrespectful it's manner like the dumb. mummy. Yes, it was a disrespect. I, I'm, not, I'm not key on, on when they use it in a disrespectful manner. But understand whether it's a respectful or disrespectful manner. They still stealing your stuff and making down millions, down. billions of dollars I for it. I could do that one, definitely. Show the disrespect and all definitely, like we, definitely, yeah, definitely, definitely. In fact, that was the topic of my book. Um, uh, uh, this is a topic. I know that you all know that I focus on ancient Kemet. But the first, the first book that I wrote was not supposed to be Seven Little White Lies, The Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Self-Image. The first book was supposed to be an, anal uh, uh, um, an actual, in fact, I made the research a DVD called Shackling the Black Child's Mind, The History of Racism in American Cartoons. For those of you who want to see the full, um, uh, like, uh, it's like a three-hour discussion, you can actually go to my website at jabariosaze.com, or you could even go to um, Center for the Restoration of Ma'at, and you'll see, um, which is centerforma'at.com, by the way, you'll see this DVD. And this goes into this concept. That was supposed to be my first book. I've, I still have the research. It's still on the burner. I had to shift it to a back burner. But understand that these stories are important. So, there are more Easter eggs in Batman v Superman. Some of you who are able to go just beneath the surface might have actually seen what I've shown you, what I just show, uh, what I've just shown you. Some of you were saying, "Jabari, that's not deep." Well, brother, I couldn't take you to the depths without first traversing from the surface and going inward. Let's go even deeper and look at some more of the Easter eggs in Batman v Superman. And why would they show you that? This is the image. Can you see that this is actually a depiction of St. Michael coming to earth to destroy Satan? <clears throat> Look at the coloring of St. Michael's clothing. Do you see it, family? Well, you should look at that and see that it is the same coloring as the Superman outfit. Damn. They go so you got to understand that they're once again connecting Superman 
to the Savior, to in this instance, the Christian myth. But let's not go, let's not even keep you there, family. Because some of you are saying, Jabari, you're not showing me ancient African myth. Yes, I am. You just don't understand how deep this goes, how ancient this goes, how much has been stolen, how much has been referenced without giving your parents the credit for this great esoteric knowledge. So t here's a, a close-up of the image. And so for those of you who don't know, what, and, and, and what is this? It, it looks just like the cake. Yes. That's what, they That's what this is. Yeah. Oh, this yeah, is the, the Superman cake. costume. Yes. 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 But how many of you who saw this said, by the way, notice the sun behind his head. Some of you yes. will say, that's a halo. See, it's yeah. the sun family. So understand that when you look at this, some of you noticed that it was Superman, um, that these were the same colors as Superman, and that's one of the reasons why they used it in the movie. But who knew what the original painting looked like? You got to go deeper, family. You got to do research. This is the original painting that it references. It's actually at a space mm. in um, St. Peter's Basilica called St. Michael's Altar. And it was a painting by a Renaissance painter known as Guido Reni, painted in 1636. And yes, some of the coloring is the same, but recognize that they actually highlighted the color even more for the movie because they wanted you to see Superman. Now understand, in the original painting, you actually see St. Michael with a spear, and he actually has his foot on Satan's head. You might say, well, this is Christian Im imagery, isn't it, Jabari? I took this, this picture with my own camera. This image is from the temple that today is known as Edfu. Its proper name is Herubehudet. But today it's called Edfu Temple. This temple, the construction of this temple, was actually um, begun around 300 um, BCE. It is constructed under the Greek rulers. But understand that the Greek, the Greek rulers didn't know how to build this stuff. They had to get ancient Kemetic architects and ancient Kemetic um, priest so to actually saying? construct this. He's standing on a hippopotamus, which is an image of Set. Ah. Yeah. So you understand the battle of Heru and Set, or Horus and Seth, as some of you are more familiar with the, the Western versions of them. Understand that this battle of the spearing of Set is something that goes way back into comedic mythology. This is not new family. Do you see he's standing on the hippo? Just like St. Michael here is standing on, on Satan? Mm -hmm. This is comedic mythology. It goes into Christianity and then into the modern movies. Now recognize that the folks who made Batman v Superman knew that they weren't just talking about the Christian story or else they wouldn't have used Batman the way that he did. Right. They, they did. They knew that they were also referencing the comedic story. And that's the reason why you see Batman cross the arms of Superman before lowering him. In fact, right before the final arm is crossed, the scene clips. Because they didn't want it to be that obvious family. They didn't want you to understand that essentially what the Tom who has been doing is cashing checks with your parents' names on them. Uh, why this is the world's greatest case of identity theft. And when you come into knowledge of who you are and knowledge of those things that are your birthright as a modern African, you will be able to draw from them yourself as well. To reference this. Oh, They're referencing what's called the flower of life today. Um, and when you, basically the way the flower of life is created, so one of these days we have to do a, a piece on, on sacred geometry. Mm -hmm. um, which is something that I've been studying for probably as long as I've been alive. Um, it's always interests me that mathematics in some way is the very, um, the very language of the divine, how the divine actually pulls together his, her powers to create the world.
And so take a look at this image. You're actually seeing a reference to the flower of life. And the way that it occurs is you have one circle. And the circle is usually a symbol of oneness and in many instances a symbol of the divine, right? Mm -hmm. But when you take that circle and draw another circle that shares, each of the circles share each other's central point, and you continue to do that, what you will do is you're going to come up with a symbol that looks like the symbol on the right. And from that symbol, you can draw every other um, geometric shape. So understand that this is a symbol of the power of divine creation. It goes into the, it's, it's earlier than the Christian church. It goes into the Christian church. Those of you who are Christians have probably seen a reference to it when you see what is of, often called, often called, the Jesus fish. And let's go further. You're also going to see Jesus coming out of this image. By the way, this image is also a feminine image. That's why you see Jesus, for example, depicted coming out of it on the, on the image on the lower left. The image is called the Vesica Pisces, the bladder of the fish. Sometimes it's called the Mandalora, which is a symbol for the almond because it's almond shaped. But understand that this symbol is a, a, a sacred feminine symbol that connects to divine creation. And that is what you are seeing. That's what you're seeing in Superman's bedroom. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, that's a Greek symbol, right? Well, you should know, first of all, the earliest image of it was actually found in a temple. Today, it's usually called the Osirion, a temple in ancient Kemet. That image may have been carved during the Greek period, but I was actually in the Metropolitan Museum with, a, with Brother Yusir Rahotep and a sister named Pelea Osset. And as we went into the museum, she was the one, I've been to the museum literally thousands of times, family, and I had not noticed that this symbol is actually etched on a, cosm a, a, a cosmetics vase. Can you see it on the right here? That is what is often called the flower of life. And this image here is the oldest known depiction of the flower of life. I am breaking news for you here, Black News 102 family, because people often, scholars often argue that even though the flower of life was found first in a comedic temple, that it may have been the Greeks that did that. And it, if it was the Greeks that did that, they try to argue that it's not an ancient comedic, ancient African symbol. But the cosmetics vase, which is actually here at the Metropolitan Museum, is at least from, a, uh, from 1200 BCE. We're saying that this image is more than 3,000 years old, much older than Greece, much older than Rome. This is an ancient African symbol that we're seeing here. The symbol that is used in sacred Christianity, even when we see the Jesus fish, and also in the Superman movie. So for those of you who are Christian, remember, when you use the Jesus, Christ, the Jesus fish, when you see the Jesus fish, you're not seeing a Christian symbol. This is an earlier symbol. Let's talk basically about the movie Suicide Squad, which also came out this year. I told you that. Um, DC has been drawing extensively. Major villain in the movie was someone called Enchantress. Enchantress. Take a look at her on the right. Did you enjoy that movie though? I thought it was a decent movie. Like it. It, wasn't, it wasn't the best movie, but it was better than um, than some of the other DC films. Just a comic book freak. It was better than some of the other DC films. This was, it was better in some ways than Batman v Superman. You know, mm -hmm. so it was it was it's a better listen. DC is still struggling to get their legs under them because they're trying to catch up to Marvel. Marvel is making billions of dollars on their movies. And then what did Marvel just do a few weeks ago? They went even further when now you may know some of the family may know that Marvel is Marvel is the comic company that created things like the X-Men, like Spider-Man, like the Avengers, like the Hulk, like Thor, like Wolverine, like all of those characters, Deadpool, all those characters come from the Marvel Universe, Captain America. And then DC is where you get um, characters like Batman, Superman, um, Wonder Woman. No, Black Panther is Marvel as well. Oh, okay. But here's the interesting thing. 
Marvel was purchased along. What does DC stand for? It, I, you know, I don't even remember anymore. <laughs> um, yeah. I think it stood for something like. Um, some people said it may have come from Detective Comics at one point. Um, but right now, you should know that DC stands for DC. They actually say that there is no meaning to the to the um, the letters anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but it may have come from Detective Comics, which is where, for for example, Batman was first published. So when you look at this, understand that um, Marvel did something well. Disney purchased Marvel several years ago, and recently, what did DC do? What did, I'm sorry, what did D Disney do? Disney just recently purchased 20th Century Fox. So what does that mean? It means that now Marvel actually has taken back some of their other properties that they had sold off. So that now we're going to see X-Men and, and perhaps the Avengers in, in the same movie because now they have the rights to it once more. Anyway. That's only for a comic book nerd. Some of you have no idea what I just said. Do your research. I think you might find it interesting. Take a look at the main villain in the Suicide Squad movie. Some of you saw her and didn't recognize that you're actually seeing comedic myth. What does it look like she has on her head? This is a reference to Het Heru, who has the cow disc, the, the um, cow horns, sometimes even depicted as the moon, and the, the moon in the middle and the cow disc on the sides. This is usually a depiction of Het Heru, who the Greeks called Hathor. Who is Hathor? Who is Her Het Heru? She is a lady of beauty. She is a lady of music. She is a lady of, of love. That's who she is. She is the wife of Heru. So interestingly, she is all being the lady of music and, and love. She in DC they called her the enchantress, someone that is able to captivate you and take control of you. They're retelling your myth family. And in fact, if you think that that's a stretch, take a look at how they depicted her when she was at full power. You actually see these waves of energy coming from her. Why? Because they were also trying to depict her wings. Het Heru, who was sometimes also conflated with Ost or Isis, has wings. And so they're also giving you the imagery of her wings. This is all coming from your story family. And you had to be able to see it in order to understand. Now finally, this is something I think is very interesting. I've told you that DC has been drawing primarily from comedic myth for its movies and, and been doing it for a really long time. Marvel has done it a little bit less. But now Marvel is getting into the act and drawing from African myth. Why? Well, it may be interesting that they began to draw from this myth for a movie trilogy that wasn't doing that well. And that was a trilogy that came from Thor. So this is the third Thor movie, known as Thor Ragnarok. By the way, what is Ragnarok? Ragnarok is supposed to be the mythological destruction of the world and of Asgard. And so Thor, the, the god of thunder in, the, in Norse mythology and also um, in this um, Marvel depiction, is supposed to be fighting against the destruction of the world. And in doing this, you're seeing that this particular um, trilogy with Thor 1 and then Thor the Dark World and then finally the final movie, they decided that they were going to try to do something a little different so that they could do better with the Thor movies. And this is where they decided that they were going to draw from comedic myth. Now I'm going to tell you, I'm probably going to stop this scene because this is the one that actually got me booted from Facebook. Right. It's for a movie that's still in theaters, but I want you to understand that what happens to Thor as he does battle with his sister, Hel, or Hela, he's doing battle with her, and what does she do in order for him to, um, in order to take control of him? In her battle, she takes his eye. 
And after she takes his eye, instead of being blinded, he goes inside and sees a vision of his father who has already died, and his father gives him power. You're actually also going to see, right when he gets his own power, his arms are spread out once again because they're talking once again about a crucifixion. And so you have to understand that in Thor, they are also drawing from the savior myth and from the deeper comedic myth. Why the comedic myth? Because we know that one of the great deities in Kemet, during, going, undergoing his great tribulation, loses his eye. Who am I referring to? I'm referring to... Heru, who some of you may know as Horus, being the Greek name. So Heru, in his great battle with his uncle, loses his eye and then receives another eye from the image of great wisdom Tehuti, who in some ways is a surrogate father to him and is certainly can, can be considered his uncle in many ways. So Tehuti actually gives him another eye and that other eye is how we get the concept of the third eye. Keep in mind he had two eyes, he loses one, he gets another eye and that eye is the third eye. This is where we get the image known as the Ujat. This is the image of the third eye. And so understand that we are drawing from comedic myth, even in the latest Thor movie. It should not be surprising that it was the best of the Thor movies and has actually grossed a considerable amount of money. So Marvel, look to Marvel to draw even further from ancient African myth for the rest of its movies. If it can rescue a franchise with your great stories family, understand they're going to continue to do it. And so let me once again give you some motivation to go back and learn and know your great stories. This uh, maxim that I'm going to finish on comes from the maxim of Patahotep. Patahotep was a man that wrote this book at the age of 110. And he writes some of the world's first wisdom literature. This is a book that is nearly 5,000 years old. And I'm going to tell you that even though you can find copies of the Maxim Batahotep in any major bookstore, guess what you're not going to see when you go to buy a copy? Guess what you're not going to see, Brother Sa? What's that, Brother? You're not going to see an image of his face. Who face? Of Patahotep's face. Oh, man. Now, here's the part that's amazing. Understand this. You're going to see several versions, several editions of this, of this particular book by different authors, different publishing companies. Everyone is drawing from it. Why is it that none of them have an image of his face? You would think that there is no image of his face, but Brother Jabari is not going to leave you there, family. I have the great honor of going to a museum in Kemet known as the Imhotep Museum. And the Imhotep Museum has several um, uh, um, life-size, full-color statues of Patahotep. So take a look at this deep brother on the left. You are seeing someone who is clearly an African. His nose is wider than both me and Sa. His lips are thicker than mine. His skin is darker than mine. And he's even wearing what Western scholars like to call the Nubian headdress. This is a man of African descent that writes the world's oldest complete book. I am telling you, family, that you have been told that you are illiterate. You have been told that you are not an intellectual. You have been told that the, that, that the great actual implements of civilization did not come from you, but were actually brought forward by the Tamfu, by the European. And that's the reason why you won't see an image of this great African's face on the cover of the book that he authored for his spiritual son at the age of 110. So what does Patahotep tell us? This is from his introduction. He says, may this servant be commanded to make a staff of old age. So as to speak to him the words of the judges, the ways of those before who listened to the Neteru. May the like be done for you so that strife may be removed from the people and the two shores may serve you. What is he actually saying? He is saying that if you want to live in prosperity, 
You should go back to the wisdom that comes from our oldest ancestors. Go back to that great wisdom and listen to the words of the judges, those who listen to the divine forces of ancient Kemet. And when you do that, strife will be removed from you and from your life. And the two shores, ancient Kemet will serve you. He is actually telling you, family, that if you draw from your ancient traditions, that the power of the world's greatest nation will be yours. Maybe the reason why we're still catching hell in 2017 and 2018 is because they're not drawing enough from the wisdom that comes from our ancestors, the wisdom from those Africans who gave the world civilization. And so as I conclude, I want to really admonish you, family, to read our sacred stories, to draw from our sacred stories, to empower yourselves from your sacred stories, and even, yes, to enrich yourselves from our sacred stories. Who else should be actually earning the income from your four parent stories? Should it not be the modern African? Should it not be you who is, who is garnering $16 billion of income from the stories that your parents told you because their parents told them. So I have to say to you, family, it is important for us to analyze pop culture because those people who are the most powerful people in the world today have been once again stealing, borrowing, and appropriating your story. It is only going to serve you if you draw from your own great myth. Thank you, Shemin Matep. And as I always close, I say, the divine force in me greets the divine force in you. Thanks again to the Sonnetta Studio, Studios TV family. I'll see you soon. Peace.